Welcome to the video book summary of Pitch Anything, an innovative method for presenting, persuading, and winning the deal by Ori Clough. This book was published in 2011 and weighing in at 548 pages. When it comes to delivering a pitch, Oren Clough has unparalleled credentials. Over the past 13 years, he has used his one-of-a-kind method to raise more than $400 million. And now, for the first time, he describes his formula to help you deliver a winning pitch in any business situation. Whether you're selling ideas to investors, pitching a client for new business, or even negotiating for a higher salary, Pitch Anything will transform the way you position your ideas. If you like what you hear in the book summary, I strongly suggest you buy the book using the link in the description. So without further ado, I bring you the book summary of Pitch Anything. Chapter 1, The Method. The process using the acronym STRONG. Setting the frame. Telling the story. Revealing the intrigue. Offering the prize. Nailing the hook point, And getting a decision. Chapter 2, The Frame. Own the frame, win the game. A frame is an instrument you use to package your power, authority, strength, information, and status. Everyone uses frames whether they realize it or not. Every social encounter brings different frames together. Frames do not coexist in the same time and place for long. They crash into each other and one or another gains control. Only one frame survives. The others break and are absorbed. Stronger frames always absorb weaker frames. The winning frame governs the social interaction. It is said to have frame control. When you are responding ineffectively to things the other person is saying and doing, the person owns the frame and you are being frame controlled. If you have to explain your authority, power, position, leverage and advantage, you do not hold the stronger frame. The power of frame. Defiance and light humor are the keys to seizing power and frame. When you are defiant and funny at the same time, he is pleasantly challenged by you and instinctively knows that he is in the presence of a pro. The time frame. The mistake most people make when they see their audiences becoming fatigued is to talk faster, to try to force their way through the rest of the pitch. Instead of imparting more valuable information faster, However, they only succeed in helping the audience retain less of their message. Here is another example of opposing time frame and how to respond to it. If you visit customers' offices, you will recognize this situation. The customer. Hi, yes, um, well, I only have about 10 minutes to meet you, but come in. Salesperson. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for fitting me into your busy schedule. This is common dialogue and the form of business etiquette, and it's exactly the wrong thing to do. You are reinforcing your target's power over you and confirming your target's higher status. You are essentially handing your target your frame and saying, here, please crush my frame, control me, and waste my time. When you encounter a time frame like this, quickly break it with a stronger prize frame of your own. Qualify your target on the spot. You. No, I don't work like that. There's no sense of rescheduling unless we like each other and trust each other. I need to know... Are you good to work with? Can you keep appointments and stick to a schedule? Your target. Okay, you're right about that. Yeah, sure, I can do that. Let's do this now. I have 30 minutes. That's no problem. Come on in. You have just broken your target's time frame. Establish that your time is important and he is now giving you focused attention instead of treating you like your visit like an annoyance. That intrigued frame. In financial deals, I respond with something like this. The revenue is 80 million, expenses are 62 million, the net is 18 million. These and other factors you can verify later, but for right now, what we need to focus on is this. Are we a good fit? Should we be doing business together? This is what I've come here to work on. If you're pitching a product and the drill down is on the price, don't chase this conversation thread. Do answer fast, answer directly with high level details only, and go straight back to the relationship question. What this tells the audience is that, number one, I'm trying to decide if you're right for me. And number two, if I decide to work with you, the numbers will back up what I'm telling you. So let's not worry about that now. And three, I care about who I work with. Keep the target focused on the business relationship at all times. Analysis comes later. 
This is the best and most reliable way to deal with the target who suddenly becomes bored and tries to entertain himself with the details of your deal. Remember, when you own the frame, you control the agenda, and you determine the rules under which the game is played. When the target agreed to meeting with you, what he or she really was saying was this, is there a puzzle I'm interested in solving? No one takes a meeting to hear about something they already know and understand. It's a fundamental concept dividing every single presentation. It's the hook that allows you, as the presenter, to grab and hold attention by subconsciously saying, I have a solution to one of your problems, I know something that you don't. This is why people agree to take meetings and to hear a pitch. At the start of your meeting, you have the audience's attention. It's a rare moment, but not for the reason you may think. Audience members are, with full concentration and at the most basic and primal level, trying to figure out the answer to the question. How similar is your idea to something I already know about or to a problem I have already solved? If the audience member discover that the answer is close to what they had earlier guessed, they will mentally check out of you. They will experience a quick ping of self-satisfaction at the moment of realization, just before they mentally check out. As your pitch moves along at any time, some or all of the members of your audience will solve the problem, see the solution, and get the whole story. Then they check out. This is why you see the presenters lose more and more of the audience as time goes on. Those who solve the puzzle drop out. We generalize by saying, oh, they've lost interest. But what really happened is they learned enough about the idea to feel secure that they understand it and there is nothing more to be gained by continuing to pay attention. They determined that there was no more value to be had by engaging with us on any level. When your target drills down into technical material, you break that frame by telling a brief about the relevant story that involves you. You need to be at the center of your story, which immediately redirects attention back to you. People will pause, look up, and listen, because you are sharing something personal. As you share your story, there has to be some suspense in it because you are going to create intrigue in telling of the story by telling only a part of the story. The intrigue story. Your intrigue story needs the following elements. It must be brief and the subject must be relevant to your pitch. You need to be at the center of the story. There should be risk, danger and uncertainty. There should be time pressure. A clock is ticking somewhere and there are ominous consequences if action is not taken quickly. There should be tension. You are trying to do something, but are being blocked by some force. There should be serious consequences. Failure would not be pretty. The prizing frame reloaded. Prizing is a way to deal with the threatening and fast approaching frames that are likely to push you into a low status position. The basics. If you're trying to win your target's respect, attention, and money, he becomes the prize. When your target is trying to win your attention and respect, you are the prize. This, of course, is what you want. Prizing is the sum of the actions you take to get your target to understand that he is commodity and that you are the prize. Successful prizing results in your target chasing you, asking you to be involved in your deal. Money is never a prize. It's a commodity. It means forgetting things done. Money simply transforms economic value from place to place so that people are able to work together. Prize in 201, avoiding the mistakes. Make the buyer qualify himself back to you. Do this by asking such questions as, why do I want to do business with you? Protect your status. Don't let the buyer change the agenda, the meeting time, or who will attend. Withdraw if the buyer wants to force this kind of change. Remember, small acts of defiance and denial combined with humor are extremely powerful in maintaining your frame of control and in the reinforcing your higher status. Chapter three, status. Elevating your social status. The hedge fund manager. A couple of years ago, I took a meeting with Bill Gar, a hedge fund manager. Here is a quick review of what happened in Bill's office that day. I found myself in Bill's office with no frame control and in the beta position. I perpetrated a mildly shocking but unfriendly act that caused a new frame collision. As the shock of my action wore off, the attention of the targets did not waver, 
believe me, it never does when you do something like this, and I continued accumulating status like a video gamer, collecting power stars as each of the targets advances to new levels. The faster you grab status, the more is available for you to take. As I captured attention, I then shifted my focus to acquiring local star power and the alpha status. I got local star power by using information dominance to quickly shrink the frame around my area of specialization, making me unassailable. Because I was an expert, no one could undermine my deal points. Using my newly acquired local star power, I quickly moved the discussion to a level where I could not be challenged by using the primary core value of hard work, domain exp expertise, and moral authority, which we'll discuss in a moment. The moment I was done with the pitch, I began to pull away and kept pulling away until I finally left the office, but not before I'd set the hook point and received a decision. Seizing situational status. Here are the steps involved in elevating your status in any situation. You'll recognize some of the actions from framing and for good reason. Frame control and status are closely related as they are the pitch technique you will learn in chapter four. Politely ignore power rituals and avoid beta traps. Be unaffected by your customer's global status, meaning the customer's status inside and outside the business environment. Look for opportunities to perpetrate small denials and defiances that strengthen your frame and elevate your status. As soon as you take power, quickly move the decision into an area where you are in the domain expert, where the knowledge and information are assignable by your audience. Apply a prize frame by positioning yourself as a reward for making the decision to do business with you. Confirm your alpha status by making your customer, who now temporarily occupies a beta position, make a statement that qualifies your higher status. Chapter four, pitching your big ideas. Pitching the big idea. Short time frames are not a choice. You can't afford to run long. The audience brain won't give you more time. And worse, when attention runs dry, after about 20 minutes, the brain starts forgetting things it has already learned. Let the target know he isn't trapped into a typical hour-long meeting. Guys, let's get started. I've only got 20 minutes to give you the big idea, which we will leave us some time to talk it over before I have to get out of here. You're going to make the pitch in four sections or phrases. Number one, introduce yourself and the big idea, five minutes. Two, explain the budget and secret source, 10 minutes. Offer the deal, two minutes. And number four, stack frames for a hot cognition, three minutes. Phrase one, introduce yourself and the big idea. Many times I've seen people spend 15 minutes or longer on their background, absurd. No one is that fantastic. Stop with one great thing. Get your track record on the table and do it fast, clean and problem free. Targets simply do not like old deals. They want to see movement. They don't want to they don't like deals that have been sitting around, ignored by other investors or partners. It would be like a copier salesman saying, Hey, how would you like the model T one hundred? We've had fifty of them in the warehouse forever. Introducing the big idea. This idea introduction pattern goes like this. Four, target customers who are dissatisfied with the current offering in the market. My idea product is a new idea or a product category that provides key problem solution features. Unlike the competing product, my idea product is described key features. Let's review the actions to take in phase one of the pitch. First, you put the target at ease by telling him in advance that your pitch is going to be short, just about 20 minutes, and that you're not going to be hanging around too long afterwards. This keeps the target's croc brain focused on the here and now and feeling safe. Then you give your background in terms of a track record of successes, not a long list of places and institutions where you simply punch the clock. There's plenty of evidence suggests the more you talk about your background, the more average it becomes because the target is hardwired to average information about you, not added up. Next, you show that your idea is not a static flash of genius. Rather, there are market forces driving the idea, that you are taking advantage of the brief market window that is opened. And you're admitted that there will be competition, showing that you're not naive about business realities. 
Because the brain pays attention to things that are in motion, you paint a picture of the idea moving out of an old market into a new one. Doing it this way, you don't trigger change blindness, which would make your deal easy to neglect. Last, you bring your idea into play by using the idea introduction pattern. Now the target knows exactly what it is, who it's for, who you compete with, and what your idea does better than the competitions. This simple pattern makes sure that your idea is easy to grasp and focuses on what is real. The strategy works so well because it avoids triggering a threat response. Phase two, explain the budget and secret source. As I look back on my experiences, two giant realizations tower above all others. Realization one, it doesn't matter how much information you give, a lot or a little, but instead how good your theory of mind is. In other words, it's important how well you can tune your information to the other person's mind. Realization two, all the important stuff must fit into your audience's limits of attention, which is for most people is about 20 minutes. Get their attention. Attention will be given when information novelty is high and will drift away when information novelty is low. What is attention? When a person is feeling both desire and tension, that person is paying serious attention to what's in front of him or her. It comes down to the presence of two neurotransmitters, dopamine and no reperephrine. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter of desire. No reperephrine is the neurotransmitter of tension. Together, they add up to attention. You need them both to be coursing through the crocodile brain. To give a dopamine kick and create desire, offer reward. To give a no reperin kick and create tension, take something away. Dopamine isn't exactly the chemical of experiencing pleasure. Instead, it's the chemical of anticipating a reward. How do you get more dopamine flowing in the brain? Novelty. A raft of brain imaging experts have demonstrated that the novel events are highly effective at releasing dopamine. Your brain is stimulated by surprise because our world is fundamentally unpredictable. He adds, you may not always like novelty, but your brain does. You create novelty by violating the target's expectation in a pleasing way. Novelty is the form of an unexpected gain, gives the brain a blast of dopamine. On the other hand, if you reward your expected fails to materialize, then dopamine dries up and negative feelings start happening. The amount of dopamine in a cocktail has to be just right. Not enough and there is no interest in you or your ideas. Too much and there is no fear or anxiety. Low key, low intensity, push and pull pattern. Push. There's a real possibility that we might not be right for each other. Pause. Allow the pause to sink in. It must be authentic. Pull. But then again, if this did work out, our forces could combine to become something great. There's a two-way connection between pushing and pulling that. When it operates simultaneously, introduces enough tension to create alertness. If you always pull the target towards you, he or she becomes cautious and anxious. Consistently pulling someone in, also known as selling hard, is a signal of needy neediness. As business people, we come together to find solutions to problems, not to admire problems that have already been solved for us. If you don't have a series of challenges for the target to overcome, with pushes and pulls and tension loops, then you don't have a pitch narrative. The heart of the pitch. Pitching numbers and projections. Every experienced buyer and investor knows that you will be doing these two things. Saying that your budgets are conservative. Preparing absolutely aggressive and optimistic plans. Focus on demonstrating your skills at budgeting, which is a difficult and highly regarded executive talent. Spend almost no time on your skills at projecting revenue, a task that a simpleton can perform. Competition. How easy is it for new competitors to jump in the game? How easy is it for customers to switch out your product with alternatives? Secret source. This one thing that would give you staying power against competition. Secret source. The unfair advantage you have over others. Phase three. Offer the deal. Describe to your audience what you are going to receive when they decide to do business with you. Chapter 5, Frame Stacking and Hot Cognitions. Phase 4, Frame Stacking and Hot Cognitions. 
Decide that you like something before you fully understand it. That's a hot cognition. In decision making, however, we don't do much analysis, if any at all. We go with our gut. Experiments have detected decisions seven seconds before the subjects felt they had made a conscious choice. We tend to like or dislike things before we know much about them. Most of the time, the data we've collected about our choices and alternatives and options aren't used to make a decision anyway. They are used to justify decisions after the fact. Even when we try the rational approach, making a list of pros and cons, if it does not come out of how we like, we go back and redo the list until it does. Hot cognition, number one, the intrigue frame. Introducing something the target is sure to want, but cannot get right now. This is the kind of narrative the targets truly enjoy. Who is the mystery man, Joshua, and how do we meet him? This works because it's not about what happened. That's actually a boring story. What's important is who it happened to and how the characters reached to the situation. Nobody cares about the narrative where you witness something. They want to see someone forced into action and positively overcoming obstacles. People want to know how they've faced obstacles and overcome them. They want to see you in situations that reveal your character. They want to know that you are someone who rises to whatever level necessary to overcome obstacles and someone who travels in the company of interesting people, who are players in whatever game you are playing. The target's brain does not love abstract concepts. Every abstract concept has to be kicked up to the neurocortex to be worked on, slowly and painstakingly. Hot Cognition 2, The Prize Frame. The basic elements of a prize frame include, I have one of the better deals in the market. I am a choosy about who I work with. It seems like I could work with you, but really, I need to know more. Please start giving me some materials on yourself. I still need to figure out if we could work well together and be good partners. What did your last business partner say about you? When things go sideways in a deal, how do you handle it? My existing partners are choosy. Hot Cognition 3, the time frame. The addition of time pressure to a decision-making event reduces decision quality. There's a scarcity bias in the brain, and potential loss of a deal triggers fear. Extreme time pressure feels forced and cut rate, but the truth is that time is a factor in every deal. You have to find the right balance between fairness and pressure and set a real time constraint. Hot Cognition 4 the moral authority frame. The president can lead us into war or with a few pen strokes sign a bill that will affect millions. But when his doctor says, turn around and take your clothes off, he does it without question. But when doctors try to impose their frame on Mother Teresa, which are, do what I say, defer to my expertise, accept my conclusions about life and death, Mother Teresa reframed with, material wealth is worth nothing. Life and death isn't critical. Help the downtrodden. A rich man is less likely to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel is to pass through the eye of a needle. I got them all to sign up to volunteer work. Chapter 6. Eradicating Neediness Neediness is a signal of threat. Do you still think it's a good deal? So, what do you think? We can sign a deal right away if you want us to. This is the purest form of validation seeking and the most lethal form of neediness. One dramatic way to eradicate neediness involves going into every social interaction with a strong time frame that you're prepared to use at any moment. This frame communicates loudly and clearly that you are needed somewhere else. But this is just a part of the broader, more comprehensive solution to eradicating neediness. Here's the basic formula. 1. Want nothing. Two, focus only on things you do well. And three, announce your intention to leave the social encounter. Three main rules of the Tao. Eliminate your desires. It's not necessary to want things. Sometimes you have to let them come to you. Be excellent in the presence of others. Show people one thing that you are very good at. And withdraw. At a critical moment, when people are expecting you to come after them, pull away. I made three points. Here's what I told the enterprise investors. This deal will be fully subscribed in the next 14 days. We don't need VC money. 
but we want a big name on our cap sheet that will strengthen our initial public offering, IPO registration. I think you guys are interesting, but are you really the right investor? We need to know more about you and the relationship and the brand value your firm can bring to our deal. Chapter 7, Case Study, The Airport Deal. The brain is wired to do things to achieve status, not money. Chapter 8, Getting the Game, Getting Started. Here are the progressive steps to learning the method. Step 1, Learn to recognize the beta traps and how to step around them. This is the low-risk way to train your mind to begin thinking in a frame-based way. As you go about your business of life, look for beta traps. Identify anything as that designed to control your behavior and think of how you would step around it. The key at this stage is to get good at seeing the traps. They are everywhere. While there is no immediate harm in doing nothing, when you are told to wait in the lobby until you're called, it's a test. Remind yourself that if you step into a beta trap, the next one will be even larger and more difficult to overcome. Step 2. In a gradual way, start stepping around beta traps. It will feel uncomfortable at first, of course, but it will push you forward to the place where it becomes natural and hardly noticeable to you. Work with a partner to practice beta trap avoidance. As I said at the start of the book, this method is powered by its simplicity. I've been practicing for over 10 years and I've survived the proposed using only four basic frames and the ability to avoid beta traps. So don't overcomplicate this or worry over your lack of technique. It will come naturally to you. Just be sure to have fun at it. That's the secret sauce. And step three, identify and label social frames. Notice the frames that you are coming at you on every level of your life. Power frames, time frames, and the analysis frames are everywhere. And they crush into you on a daily basis. Develop your ability to see them coming. Describe them and discuss them with your partner. Become very good at identifying frames using the unique language of framing. And step four, begin to initiate frame collisions with safe targets. Those who pose no major career risk to you. What I'm saying is here, tomorrow, don't stride into the CEO's office, grab a sandwich out of his hand and put your feet on his desk, telling him that it's time you and he had a little talk about your bonus. Working with a partner. Bring to overtake opposing frames in a fun, lighthearted way. I'm repeating this because it's so critical. Remember that humor and a soft touch are absolutely necessary. Without it, you will appear rude and arrogant and will trigger croc brain defense responses instead of engaging your target in a fun and spirited social exchange. Step 5. The small acts of defiance and denial you use to take control of the social frame will create a certain amount of conflict and tension. This is the point of push and pull. Delivering these acts with a soft touch reassures your target's crock brain that everything is okay, that there is no clear and present danger. If you are having difficulty at this stage, it is because you are triggering defense responses, which means you are coming on too strong. If this is the case, pause. Do not press forward if you're struggling because this means that something is wrong. Find another partner to do this with, choose a different social environment and practice in another venue or just punch, reset and start over. Step six, frame control cannot be forced because this takes the fun out of it. This is not theater for someone else to enjoy. It's not a dog and pony show. It's a game for your own personal enjoyment. And for a moment, consider why we play the games to enjoy ourselves in challenging but fair way where we can rack up a win. If you find yourself forcing the method, fortunately, this is an easy problem to fix. Simply lighten up a little bit. When you say something that causes a frame collision, do it with a twinkle in your eye and a smile in your heart. Your target will feel your goodwill and good humor and respond in a positive way. Above all, remember that this is not a conventional sales technique. You need not to be a backslapping, guffling, blow hard to win business from your customers. There is no pressure here, no brute force and no anxiety. Instead, this is a fun game that you bring to every target with whom you meet. Simply enjoy every moment and others will enjoy it with you. It's nice to know that your continued happiness is what will make you successful. What could be easier? And step seven, work with other frame masters. Now that you've developed a basic level of the skill, seek out others who are better than you. 
and with other artistic or athletic endeavor, apprenticeship leads to mastery faster than going at it alone. Continue to work with others. Like a 10th Dan Black belt, you never stop refining your technique and honing your mastery. Keep it simple. Stick to a few frames that work for you and avoid complication. In the pitch method, less really is more. As you advance, teach others. When you become a frame master, and even on your journey to becoming one, you will have most fun you've ever had. I find myself cracking up sometimes in the middle of a pitch, even when the busyness I'm doing involves millions of dollars. Why not? This is a game where you see the rules and then change the rules as needed to maintain your continuous advantage without ever upsetting your opponent. Imagine that. The only rule is that you make the rules that the others follow. Because you set the agenda and control the frame. This is a game you can never lose. How could that not be fun? What I got out of Pitch Anything, my favorite bits. Make the buyer qualify himself back to you. Do this by asking such questions as, why do I want to do business with you? Data we collect about choices and alternatives and options aren't used to make a decision. They are used to justify the decisions after the fact. After the pitch, don't be needy and ask, so what do you think? Instead, withdraw. Withdrawal technique about scarcity and include limited time, lots of demand elsewhere, and express concerns that this client may not be right fit for the deal anyway, because a good fit is so important to you. And last but not least, have fun. Inject humor. Small act of defiance can be fun for everyone. And that's a wrap on Book 92, Pitch Anything by Auron Claff. Subscribe to our channel for future video book summaries and follow us on Instagram, hashtag bestbookbits. This summary is from the website marketingfirst.co.nz. Watch previous video book summaries on our channel. If you like the video and want to buy the book, click the link in the video description to purchase from Amazon. Thanks for watching and I hope you learned a thing or two. Have a great day.